Hi class, welcome to your lecture on Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy. Now this is a really fun text, and I think the most inspired text we've read so far. However, because it's written by a very young and scholarly man, trying to make his reputation with his first book in the German university system, its mixed style between scholarship and inspiration can be an acquired taste. I've included in the modules for this week a reading of section one of The Birth of Tragedy, read by Al Yin and produced by me, in order to ease your transition into Nietzsche's style. The core idea of Nietzsche's text could be understood as a return to the ancient idea of musike. In song and dance, man expresses himself as a member of a higher community. Supernatural sounds emanate from his very body. He is no longer an artist, he has become a work of art. And in these paroxysms of intoxication or rausch, the artistic power of all nature reveals itself. In this sentence and many others, Nietzsche has completed the transition from a receptivity aesthetics, beholden to the artwork and its critics, into an active aesthetics which sees all of nature and human life as a living work of art. The core idea Nietzsche proposes is a bit like Schiller's sense drive and form drive, now understood through the indigenous Greek gods Apollo and Dionysus. The School of Life video on this is pretty helpful for the beginner, but of course Nietzsche's text says so much more. The birth of tragedy is framed as a contribution to the science of aesthetics. It wants us to understand the Apollonian and the Dionysian duality, the relationship between will and representation, and the history of religious art as inherently conflictual and rooted in a Heraclitian metaphysics. There are many Greek deities with connections to art, but Nietzsche will focus on these two as exemplary. There is the imagistic art of sculpture associated with Apollo in the ancient Greek world, and then there is the non-imagistic Dionysian art of music. The drive towards formal contemplation of model images is what Greek art was taken to be by Winckelmann, who understood the Greeks as the Apollonian people of measure, harmony, and beauty. The Greek world of images and ideal models to aspire to gives birth to Platonic philosophy, but for Nietzsche it was always stimulated by a culture that privileged revelry and festival. Eventually, two competing demands in the ancient Greek nature, their Apollonian and Dionysian drives marry in the art form that is tragedy. The Birth of Tragedy contains 25 chapters. We'll be focusing on the first seven. Tragedy's great accomplishment for Nietzsche suffers a diminution in Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the rise of Western rationality. As a derivative or degenerate form of Apollo worship, Nietzsche's role in the avant-garde of the late 19th century is to suggest that modernity, and the Germans in particular, have an opportunity to renew the collective artwork that tragedy was through the rising star that is Richard Wagner's musical operas. The secret of tragedy and the saving power of art will only be realized for us when we become part of regenerative artistic communities. Needless to say, Nietzsche's adulation of Wagner caused the book to be ill-received in the conservative academic establishment of his time. So let's talk about the Apollonian, first connecting the god Apollo to the religious institutions of the ancient Greek world with which he was associated. Nietzsche understands Apollo as a dreaming god, the god of the beautiful illusion of the inner world of fantasy. This relates Apollo to his role in incubation sanctuaries in ancient Greek medicine. Doctors or healers, iatromantoi, dedicated their practice, their shrines, and their caves to the god Apollo. The person in need of physical or spiritual healing would seek out and convalesce in one of these sanctuaries, the healing being considered complete when the goddess Hugaia, the goddess of health, as well as Apollo and Apollo's son, Asclepius, sent the patient an initiatory dream. Lucid dreaming for Nietzsche is a primordial aesthetico-existential phenomena. When we sense that the dream is appearance but will to dream on, we discover the primordial aesthetic relation between the artist and reality. Philosophers fall in love with this experience to such a degree that they wish only to dream the reality of existence. Although after the rise of the Hellenistic Empire and Alexander the Great, Apollo will come to be known as a sun god, his archaic and classical worship associates him more with beautiful appearance, illusion, and shining. For Nietzsche, this means that Apollo is the god of all plastic energies, master of the beautiful appearances of the inner world of imagination. Nietzsche had in fact read Kant's critique very carefully by this point, and had even written drafts of a doctoral dissertation on the concept of teleology in Kant's third critique. 
Before too long, however, Schopenhauer became his dominant intellectual influence. The Apollonian and the Dionysian are still, however, a naturalization of Kant's beautiful and sublime, even though the Apollonian and the Dionysian can be more immediately mapped on Schopenhauer's distinction of the world as will and the world as representation. Their analysis in Nietzsche is still replete with elements of Kantian aesthetics. In the final section of a short text or draft of The Birth of Tragedy titled The Dionysian Worldview, Nietzsche explicitly takes up this point, arguing against his master Schopenhauer's reduction of the Kantian faculties to the two basic ones of sensibility and understanding, proposing instead an understanding of Apollo as the play of the imagination and of the Dionysian as the horror of the sublime. This association of Nietzsche with Kantian aesthetics is not, however, complete, since Nietzsche as well describes Apollo as sublime or erhaben. Nevertheless, Apollo represents the sublimity of beauty, while the Dionysian is more associated with darkness and the excessive manifestation of truth. Both are gods of radiant manifestation and revelation in art, Apollonian art being associated with a floating appearance, shine and the Dionysian being associated with a primordial one. In the end, Apollo and Dionysus are not so conflictual, but brothers with competing qualities who contain the seed of the opposite within each one. And this is how Apollo as the shining one has the shadow form as a god who sends plagues, gives riddling oracles, and strikes youth dead. Schopenhauer wrote his world as will and representation in the context of the birth of Indology or the study of Indian thought in Germany. Also Nietzsche's close philologist friend Paul Deussen went on to write the most illuminating texts on Indian philosophy that had yet been produced. The Apollonian is thus assimilated for Nietzsche to the Indian veil of Maya, the stormy chaos of the ocean in which each individual sits quietly in a besieged barge trusting in the principle of individuation. Here again, the oceanic Dionysianism of the pre-individual threatens to engulf the Apollonian self, but the human being persists in faith regarding the boundaries of its own individuality and thus produces the dream image of salvation, despite the manifest reality of a world of serene destruction. Having read Schopenhauer's text, The Fourfold Root of the Principle of Sufficient Reason, the experience of Maya or dreamy Apollo, when confronted with the Dionysian chaos, comes to recognize a second truth, not just the survival of the products of individuation in a private eternity, but the breaking through of the veil of Maya of a Dionysian mysticism or Mayanatic terror of blissful ecstasy that wells up from the innermost nature of man and causes the principle of individuation to suffer an exception. Yes, we are individuals, but the primordial one, which is prior to the process of individuation, at moments such as these, awakens to the process of nature in the human form. This brings us to the Dionysian. In indigenous Greek religion, the god Apollo can be associated with healing, prophecy, epic poetry, and sculpture. What all these artistic and religious institutions have in common is an emphasis on beautiful dreaming. The Dionysian, however, is most primordially associated with a frenzied intoxication, or art states not of beautiful dreaming, but of festivity, dance, ecstatic madness, and tragic theater. The German Rausch can be translated as intoxication or ecstasy, literally, to stand outside oneself. Nietzsche is writing this book as both a wannabe philosopher and as a classical philologist, and he notes correctly for the first time in the philological literatures the influence of psychedelics on the history of art. Nietzsche is concerned that the Dionysian art states of human nature have few licensed outlets in the modern world. The rise of Christianity gradually reduced pagan festival to carnival. The true festivities of the pagans and early Christians were repressed, but they nevertheless broke out all over medieval Europe in the eruption of festivities of Dionysian human nature. Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Dancing in the Streets, A History of Collective Joy, is a wonderful, readable account of these topics to which Nietzsche only devotes one sentence in The Birth of Tragedy. Nietzsche's still romantic but accurate description 
of the types of mystical social experiences produced by the Dionysian will end up being taken into the foundations of modern sociology in Emile Durkheim's concept of collective effervescence. Human beings are beings of nature who nevertheless feel alienated, hostile, and subjugated in regards to the mother from which we all spring. The Dionysian welcomes humanity and its prodigal achievements home into a naturalization of aesthetic experiences rooted in a metaphysical transcendental imaginary. This is where Maya appears to the Apollonian as the protection of individuals from chaos. But in the Dionysian, Maya appears as nature's transfiguration. The ancient Greek poet Simonides had said that poetry is spoken painting. Likewise, Nietzsche asks us to transform the music of Beethoven's Hymn to Joy into the visionary experience of an embodied universal harmony. In the first great era of disenchantment, Following on the heels of the first and second industrial revolution, as well as the transformation of the university into a technical school, Nietzsche promotes in this book a re-enchantment of the world, wherein human beings learn to see themselves not only as artists, but also as works of art. Nietzsche's overall analysis of the Apollonian and the Dionysian duality is complicated, but it can be broken down into six basic positive points and their opposite. Here you see the image of Apollo by the famous French symbolist painter Gustave Moreau, painting around the same time that Nietzsche is writing The Birth of Tragedy. Gustave Moreau could be understood as painting all the theses of Nietzsche's own text when he writes that Apollo is visionary dream and healing, faith in the boundaries of individuation, consistent rhythm, beauty and pleasure in appearance, the plastic arts, and the injunction to limitation. Whereas the Dionysian is the call to return to primordial unity to the reconciliation of humanity and nature, to an intense variability in rhythm, melody, harmony, and gesture that is more ecstatic rather than entrancing music and dance, and to the suffering of ecstasy, creative transfiguration, and excess or the orgiastic as truth. While Apollo recommends measure and self-knowledge, Dionysus asks for our pathos, that is, for our profundity of feeling, even for the monstrous. Nietzsche considers Apollo and Dionysus not merely as expressions of the human psyche, but as artistic energies that burst forth from nature without the mediation of the human artist. The Apollonian and Dionysian are respectively the Uranian or sky dimensions of human nature, as well as the Chthonic, or mystic abyss and rebirth through the earth. All human life involves a melding of image-making consciousness or Schopenhauer's representation as well as a boundary dissolution which relates us to the most primordial force in nature, or Schopenhauer's will. Note that Nietzsche doesn't think that the Dionysian gives us immediate access to noumenal reality or Kant's thing in itself, but rather that it bypasses, if only for a moment, the representational, providing a feeling or pathos for what lies beyond our individuated state. With reference to these immediate art states in nature, Every artist is an imitator, that is, either an Apollonian artist in dreams or a Dionysian artist in ecstasies, or, as in Greek tragedy, at once an artist in dreams and in ecstasies. Nietzsche now turns to a historical genealogy of the Apollonian and Dionysian dimensions of Greek culture from the archaic through the classical period. There are many influences on Nietzsche here, but probably the two most significant are his colleague Jakob Burkhardt, whose lectures on the Greeks and Greek civilization Nietzsche had attended at Basel, as well as Friedrich Kruser's Symbolique, still to be translated into English. Nietzsche's genealogy begins Bronze Age Mycenaean Greek culture, which he understands as more elemental, savage, Dionysian, or Titanic. The myths from the Bronze Age pass down through the Greek Dark Ages, and inherited by Homer, bespeak a profoundly pessimistic view of the world. Homer, for Nietzsche, reflects the birth of Apollonian religion as an aesthetic sublimation of terrible truth. The Olympian magic mountain and pantheon, for all its shining beauty, has its roots in Dionysian folk wisdom and is the rapturous vision beyond suffering. Nietzsche thus understands Homeric epic as an Apollonian art of beautiful illusion. But instead of praising its optimism or cheerfulness, as an expression of Greek reason, he sees Homeric epic as a symptom of repression of the Dionysian truth. Most positively, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and the arts of the lying poets, 
remain connected to what is the profoundest existential truth for Nietzsche in this book, namely that only as an aesthetic phenomena is human and divine existence justified. The world and all its individuals is itself the projection or dream image of a primordial unity in Nietzsche's thought. The ur -Ein awakens to the cognitive form of phenomena in the process of individuation. When a great artist or genius transfigures the world aesthetically, this produces a profound existential satisfaction, which is not only the artist's own, but belongs to the primordial unity. Life and the world are justified by art and creativity, and Nietzsche calls this the only satisfactory theodicy. Both the Apollonian and the Dionysian art states, however, equally have a claim on aesthetic justification, and so begins the history of their conflicts and their melding across the development of Greek art and culture. This slide shows the five basic stages according to Nietzsche's history of Greek art, reflecting competing tendencies towards a conservative Apollonianism and a sensual lyricism, eventually merging completely in Attic tragedy. In section seven of The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche sets his sights on the origin of tragedy, arguing that it emerged from the tragic chorus. Instead of seeing the chorus of elders as an extension of the audience, and thus as ideal spectators of the actions on the stage, Nietzsche considers the chorus as originally an ecstatic band of revelers in the theosos or troop of Dionysus. That is, as human beings ecstatically renaturalized as fantastic natural beings such as satyrs, selenae, myonads, who collectively and in turns are intoxicated performers of the tragic myth. Nietzsche considers the function of the chorus in the surviving tragedies we have from the classical age, from Aeschylus through Sophocles and Euripides, to hint at but no longer perform this function of the original chorus. Different theories as to which exact festival of Dionysus invented and institutionalized tragedy as an art form are still being debated. And Nietzsche's theory has many contemporary critics despite being generally endorsed by the Cambridge Ritual School. I still find Nietzsche's theory of the birth of tragedy from the tragic chorus both plausible and compelling. For Nietzsche, the Greek satyr was something sublime and divine. Confronted with him, the man of culture shriveled into a mendacious caricature. The Dionysian Greek wants truth and nature in their most ferocious forms, and sees himself changed as by magic into a satyr. Such magic transformation is the presupposition of all dramatic art, in this magic transformation, the Dionysian reveler sees himself as a satyr, and as a satyr in turn, he sees the god. This quote from The Birth of Tragedy reminds us of the concluding words of Nietzsche's first philosophical essay written at age 18. Around the hero, everything turns into a tragedy. Around the demigod, a satyr play. And around God, what? Perhaps the world? The satyr is again there in the liminal position between humanity and the overhuman. Here, at the point of extreme danger or dissolution into the Dionysian, art for Nietzsche draws near as an enchantress who comes to rescue and heal, reshaping the disgusting, horrific, and absurd aspects of life into notions with which it is possible to live. These are the sublime as the artistic taming of the horrible and the comic as the artistic discharge of disgust at the absurd. You can see here the beginnings of Nietzsche's overall theory of art as healing redemption through illusion. The link between art and truth as the presentation of the absolute is severed in Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy. The truth is a Dionysian excess that refuses integration, but humans use art to ameliorate their difficult experiences. The hard-won alliance or marriage of Apollonian and Dionysian art states in tragedy was however short-lived. Before long, Socratic rationalism through the Platonic dialogues provided a third paradigm. Nietzsche's idea that we have art in order to save ourselves from the truth continues in his thinking after the birth of tragedy and sits sometimes uneasily beside his affirmation of art as a metaphysical supplement to the reality of nature. Art is to be affirmed because it is essentially the blessing, affirmation, and deification of existence. And so art is both a salvation from horror as well as the highest task and proper metaphysical activity of this life. We have art in order not to die of the truth. And the essence of all beautiful art, of all great art, is gratitude.
Music for Nietzsche in later parts of The Birth of Tragedy becomes the non-representational but yet metaphysical art par excellence. Music speaks the immediate language of the will and reveals the heart of the world to us as a pure play of forces imbued with intelligence. The ancient Greek culture of musike understood the centrality of music to the aesthetic experience and included both gesture and dance or poetry and mythology within musical expression. For Nietzsche, the aesthetic and Dionysian drama in particular is conceived as an antidote. Overgrowth of scientific rationality, Nietzsche contends that the Greeks needed to create beautiful art because they suffered so deeply. Looking back at his first book in 1886, first in his attempt at self-criticism, Nietzsche writes that the artist's metaphysics he proposes in The Birth of Tragedy is a youthful work full of youthful courage and youthful melancholy. The book is much too long, stormy and stressful for what it has to say, but should still be respected for having impressed Wagner and being an essential book of its time. The middle Nietzsche wants to resituate the book in terms of the project of looking at science through the prism of the artist, but also looking at art through the prism of life. And he repeats, I find it an impossible book today. I declare that it is badly written, clumsy, embarrassing, with a rage for imagery and confused in its imagery, emotional, here and there sugary to the point of effeminacy, and even in pace lacking the will to logical cleanliness. Very convinced and therefore too arrogant to prove its assertions, it is a book for the initiated, music for those who were baptized in the name of music, and who from the very beginning are linked to one another by shared and rare experiences of art. The principal value of the book and its continued effects is that it knows very well how to seek out fellow enthusiasts and to entice them onto new secret paths and dancing places. It is a strange book written in a strange voice and dedicated to an unknown god who conceals himself beneath the cowl of the scholar. It ought to have sung this book, this new soul, and not to have spoken. What a pity it is that Nietzsche did not dare to write this book as a poet. Despite all these flaws in The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche thinks its basic question, what is the Dionysian, continues to represent a fundamental advance in our understanding of the ancient Greeks and their art. See you next week. Now, with the gospel of world harmony, each man feels himself not only reunified, reconciled, reincorporated, and merged with his neighbor, but genuinely one, as if the veil of Maya had been rent, and only its shreds still fluttered in front of the mysterious original unity.